Hello, hello, hello. I am Teresa Cordova, Director of Great Cities Institute. We are so happy you're here and we so want to welcome you to our space. We're really, really excited that you all are here, taking the time to be here and are joining us in this. We're very, very excited about this event. Uh, this is our second uh, of the semester in our real-time Chicago lecture. We do these every, every uh, semester. Um, a lot of what we've done in our real-time Chicago series is we'll have practitioners who are involved in the front lines come and share some of their knowledge and experiences. And then we have uh, someone else then, an expert of sorts, that they can respond to and, and, uh, and set us up for some more conversation on what some of the issues are. So at once we've done that, once our speakers have presented their, uh, made their presentations, then we will open it up for Q&A and for more discussion. So with that, I'm very pleased uh, now to introduce also Megan Carney, um, uh, who is the director of UIC's Center for Gender and Sexuality uh, Center. And we are really excited also to be partnering, we're making, we're, be partnering uh, with the center on this event. So uh, with that, I want to thank Megan, and uh, let's welcome her to provide our introductions. And, you know, thanks to everyone um, here at the Great Cities Institute for making this possible. What a great turnout for a lunchtime program. I see people still out in the hallway. We have seats. If you want to come in, you're welcome to join us. My name is Megan Carney. I'm the director of the Gender and Sexuality Center here. We're right across the highway and all the construction um, in the Behavioral Sciences Building if you ever want to come by and visit us in our space. You know, um, I was so grateful when um, the staff of Great Cities reached out to us and said, you know, we're really trying to tackle critical issues in the city, and we want to get the university engaged in community conversations. And, you know, Jack called me up and was like, where do we want to go with this? And we had a couple of conversations about um, how we might want to position the conversation to build on the moment that's happening and not um, start at square one. Right? How do we look at the mobilizations that are taking place around our city, the coalition building that's been taking place over decades, and then we want to point to some things in the last year where some energy has really been taking off around addressing homelessness as is experienced by LGBTQ youth. And so this is a very exciting moment, and we're really hoping for a conversation that moves us forward and gives everybody who's here today opportunities to step into that conversation and take some action. I get the privilege of introducing our speakers today, but I also wanted to just do a little name drop around an organization that's not physically here, but here in spirit. And I want to um, mention YEP, the Youth Empowerment Performance Project. Has anyone heard of YEP? Yes. Yay. Yeah, great, lots of enthusiasm. <laughs> um, Youth Empowerment Performance Project, they use theater development and playmaking as a way to directly counter some of the stigmatization around queer youth homelessness and really start to change the narrative and the stories of young people who are directly affected by homelessness. And um, Bonsai Bermudez, the artistic director, reached out to me and invited me to pass out um, one of their slogans that they distribute that says, we say young people experiencing homelessness. Homelessness is a condition, not an identity. No one should be named a homeless youth. And I think that this really points to some of the interesting nuances in the conversation we're going to be having today. I'm excited to learn from our experts about this too, of how are we using the language, right, to reframe the conversation, to destigmatize youth and move forward. So I made a bunch of these copies with the hope that you will take at least one and go distribute it somewhere and be part of extending the conversation we start here today. I'll leave those up here for everybody. And with that, let me tell you who is here to talk with us. We're going to start off with Devin Redmond, who is a coordinator at the crib. Tell you a little bit about the crib. The crib first opened in January 2011 as a four-month pilot program funded by the city of Chicago. The pilot project was a result of meetings between the Knight Ministries Youth Advocacy Group with the acronym HELLO, Homeless Experts Living Life's Obstacles, and former Chicago Mayor Richard Daly. At the time, the crib was the only overnight shelter for homeless youth ages 18 to 24 in Chicago and the only program of its kind in the Midwest. 
In January 2013, after operating seasonally its first two years, the City of Chicago offered the Night Ministry additional funding to expand the program to year-round operations. In addition, throughout 2013, the city has expanded their model onto other neighborhoods in Chicago. Today, there are four additional programs modeled on the crib, operating across the city, and providing homeless young people with access to a network of comprehensive services. So we'll hear more about that from Devin, but I'm going to introduce the others um, before we get started. So we also have with us Carrie Kaufman, who is a collective member with Project Fierce. Project Fear Chicago is a grassroots collective of radical social workers, housing advocates, and young people who are working together to establish identity-affirming transitional housing in Chicago. Project Fierce's mission is to reduce LGBTQ youth homelessness in Chicago by providing transitional housing and support services to homeless LGBTQ young adults. Project Fear Chicago launched publicly with a fundraising campaign in April of 2013 and received an overwhelming community response. Since their initial campaign, the collective has grown tremendously and they have raised the money needed to purchase their first home. Yay. Yes. See, movement's happening. And uh, finally, Tracy Bame, the publisher and executive editor of Windy City, Me Windy City Media Group, is here today who is going to kind of pull us all together, right, and, and moderate us into conversation. Who better than you, Tracy, <laughs> yeah. to do this? And I do want to do a personal thanks to Tracy, who reached out to me and the Gender and Sexuality Center last year, um, and I see Kim Hunt in the back, um, who reached out as one of the coordinators of the Youth Summit that we'll be talking about a lot today. We're really proud to host that, part of that, here at UIC last year, so thank you for that. Windy City Media Group serves the diverse communication needs of the LGBTQ community. It produces Windy City Times, Chicago's only weekly LGBT newspaper, as well as Night Spots, a bi-weekly club guide, Windy City Queercast Radio, plus video content online. Published since 1985, Windy City Times, there are copies here. Uh, Windy City Times is a member of the National Gay Newspaper Guild and has received numerous honors for its work, both from journalism organizations and from the LGBT community. So, we have a fantastic um, panel here today, um, and with that I want to introduce F to Devin. Come on up and get us started. Thank you. Hi, right, hello everybody. Hi. Uh, you know, I want to try to avoid this face <laughs> and be able to work this. Um, but first, I would like to thank you guys all for the opportunity to speak in front of you today and for everybody who helped put this together. Um, I'm excited to tell you about the work that the crib does. Um, yeah, and we're going to talk about right, homeless LGBTQ youth and providing for services. So I'm going to throw some stats at you, but I'm honestly more excited about the discussion and conversation that we'll have afterwards. So I'll try to keep this pretty brief. Um, yeah. So. We all know what it's like to fear rejection, right? We all know what it feels like to be a fish out of water, to wonder if anyone really gets who I am. If I tell them the full circumstances of my life, will they accept me? Likewise, I'm sure we all know what it's like to walk into a room in a new job for the first time. And in addition to not even knowing where the bathrooms are, the constant questions in our head, do I feel safe with these people? How much should I reveal about myself? Can I be myself? We all know what that's like, and it's not easy. Now, imagine if you have all of that going on in the context of homelessness. So, um, that's what we encounter with a lot of the young people that we see, right? Um, at the crib, so, a little background, I started the day it began being continuously open. So I've been fortunate enough to see sort of the impact of having the program be offered year round as opposed to just six months. And as sort of a background to how the crib even became possible, um, we the Night Ministry has a youth outreach team which goes out and outreaches to young people on the streets of, uh, on the corner of Belmont and Halstead, two nights a week. And so it was a space where people would come create community, have food, in the summer times, a lot of games. But then the staff wondered, okay, so around 11 p.m. when this wraps up, where do the young people go? And so through thinking 
hey, why don't we create a space that the young people can get off of the streets and have a safe bed and have meals and have the support of community outside of this team. And so that's sort of how the crib got created. So we still partner, you know, we're one of the many net ministry programs that works with youth, but um, I think it's really cool sort of how it was created and the name came from the young people. They wanted to call it the crib, so that's sort of where that came from. People always think it's their babies there though, and that's not really true. We just, <laughs> but I can understand the, uh, the confusion. Um, So we were founded, the Night Ministry was founded in 1976, um, and the, the idea behind it was that there are these people who were on the streets who often have been ignored, rejected for a variety of reasons, cast out, cast aside, kicked to the side, and are lonely. And so our founder, Tom Behrens, he learned that the core to providing services to those in need is accepting them for who they are at that moment in time and entering into a relationship with them, using that open and affirming relationship to help springboard to services. And so from those, from that humble beginning, we now have um, all of these here services. So that youth outreach team that I mentioned serves the 225 young people each week. Um, we have 53 shelter beds for homeless youth in the city, and that goes from ages 14 to 24, depending upon the program. Um, and the length of time is between an overnight to transitional up to two years. So the crib, which is what we're here to talk about today, is the program that's only overnight. So it's just a night to night basis. There's no sort of guarantee that anybody gets in night to night, and there's no guarantee beyond that night whether or not you can have a place. So it's at the ground level, the most sort of emergency based organization that we can provide for the young people. So another question that we always see is like, why, you know, why do you become homeless? How do they come to us? And I think a lot of times when, you know, people see a homeless person on the street, there's this just sort of nasty, get a job or it's your fault sort of ideology that goes on. It's just uh, not helpful at all. But what I've come to learn about the young people at the crib is they're not, you know, bad people. They they're not getting kicked out because. They couldn't handle structure. A lot of the people that we see have been kicked out because they've come out as being gay or trans or, you know, just not being sure. And we're learning that, like, <laughs> most of the people that come would give up the structure that they have because they're not afraid to be who they are. And that is such an inspiring group and reason that we have the young people that we do. And so I think that's where it starts, is trying to figure out what happened to somebody and why they're in the position that they're in, but also not stigmatizing or labeling somebody as a homeless young person, right? They're a young person who's experiencing homelessness. It's not, it's not a label, it's not an identifier, it's a situation. So I mean, you'll see a lot of the reasons, right, that happens for our young people, physical abuse, alcohol, drug abuse, and that typically is occurring from the caregivers, not necessarily from the young people, right? Failed DCFS placement, mental illness, gender or sexual identity, exposure to trauma, pregnancy and family economics. The point of that being, right, if we serve 250 young people in a year, there's 250 different reasons why they're there. And to not sort of judge people for it, anything like that. All right, here's some statistics that we have, because people love stats, right? So. There are more than 24,000 people who are registered as homeless with Chicago Public Schools. So this is not a small issue by any means, right? Uh, 12,000 unaccompanied youth on the streets every year in Chicago. Again, we provide 53 beds, so that much less than the need. And 82,000 homeless youth are enrolled in the state of Illinois. That's too many, right? So there was a study that was conducted with um, 11 organizations throughout the Midwest. And here are some of the findings. The average first episode of homelessness is at 15. I don't know what you guys were doing when you were 15, but I imagine what it's like to be on the streets, right? More than 51% were asked or told to leave. 23% report leaving due to physical or emotional abuse. 23% reported leaving because of problems with drug or alcohol. 
49% spent a night in a hotel room, paid for somebody else, and more than half slept rough. And 30% identify as LBGTQ, and 7% as transgender. So that's sort of in the whole Midwest, right? That's not necessarily the crib. So when we talk about LBGTQ homeless youth, right, they're disproportionately represented in the homeless youth population. Somewhere between 20 to 40% identify on that spectrum, whereas 10% in the general population. They're more often sexually victimized. 7.4% report um, acts of sexual violence against them. They're more than twice as likely to attempt suicide. And as we know, like, there's just freedom where you, you, young people are questioning or coming out more and younger than ever. And so we see that as parents and support systems still don't know how to accept some young people, um, that puts them in precarious situations earlier and earlier. I don't know if any of you guys have seen this before, but I think this is such a super kind of little helpful um, thing to learn what we talk about and what we mean when we talk about identity, expression, orientation, and sex. So we start with biological sex, right? I mean, that, that refers to the objectively measurable organs. So you go, I mean, the big point, the takeaway from all of this is that the binaries aren't helpful. Almost every aspect of this occurs on a continuum, and everybody falls somewhere along that continuum. And the more that we have organizations that are pushing these boundaries and you know, asking the city, hey, when we do our reports, we don't want just male or female, because that does not capture all of the young people that we see. So gender identity, right, is sort of the what goes on in your head, you know? And that goes from woman to a man, gender queer, androgynous, all, all of those. But the main um, thing that we talk about is expression, right? And so that's sort of the combination of all of those factors and how you present yourself to the people that you surround yourself with. Um, and so that's one of the things about the crib that I think is really, is really unique, is that we encourage our young people to sort of self-express and identify exactly as they would like to be. And I think that's unique because a lot of the young people that we talk to, there are other neighborhoods in the city where they don't necessarily feel that they can be who they are. And so that, I mean, think about that, right? If you have to sort of closet yourself in just to be able to pass on the train or to not get abused, you have to sort of put the things inside of you. We talk about our transgendered females, right? I mean, they, um, they're scared to go to the South Side. I mean, that's just reality, right? Because they, they're targeted a lot. And so I think that's what's interesting about the crib is that we're located in Lakeview, but we're not, we weren't originally created as a space for like only LBGTQ youth, but we found that that's sort of the, the neighborhood where most of our guests feel safest. So that's sort of how it has turned into the place that it has, which as we'll see. Um, so 70% I would say of our, of our clients are LBGTQ. Um, we served over 250 young people in, in the last year 25% are transgender or gender non-conforming. And so the crib, again, basic overnight shelter. We're open from 8.30 p.m. until 9 a.m. every morning. So we've recently um, extended our capacity for 22 beds. We're in the basement of a church. We have one big room where the kids do everything. So they all eat, sleep, do all our activities in one room. Now imagine 22, 18, and 24 year olds in one room, you know, after the day that they've had throughout the night. So it's a pretty chaotic space, but, but, but it's meant to be that way and we like it for that. So what I think is so cool about things like Project Fierce is that they do the things that we kind of can't do because we have such a low capacity on every night. We have three staff to, to handle kind of all the stuff that goes on and getting through a night. And so for the most part, we're just there as a fulfilling basic needs, right? Two meals, shower, referrals, group activities, but we don't have a lot of capacity to do things like um, helping our young people get housing, right? So that's why we need other agencies to partner with who can do that or who that's their mission. Our mission is just to get people off the streets and to feel safe, which, you know, that, that can be quite a challenge sometimes. I have some pictures, so we're not allowed to take pictures usually in this space, but I don't know if you guys have heard of The Home Stretch. It's a documentary that profiles 
three homeless youth in the city, and sort of the fourth youth is like the crib. So because of that film, we were able to get some pictures of the place. So sort of, you can maybe piece together what it looks like. So, um, very colorful. This is sort of the idea that this is the one room, right, that all the kids get to go into. Uh, and then we serve food from our kitchen, right? So it's a very colorful kind of crazy place because we encourage people to sort of be who they are, right? And in a world that doesn't necessarily allow people to do that, it's really kind of a special place. Uh, and then the last thing is sort of, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I think is most important and unique about what we do and the stuff that I really want to talk about. Um, so when we talk about creating a safe space, right, I think these are sort of the foundational aspects of our program and what leads it to happen that way. So we're a low threshold program, which means that when a young person comes in at night, we don't ask them for their ID, we don't ask them, we don't search them, we don't... You know, we don't ask them for their legal name. They come in as their given name, hi, I'm Bubbles, and they just write that, and that's good. Because, so, what that allows us to do is be able to let the young people self-identify, um, which is sort of that first baseline of acceptance. Is when you come in here, you are who you are, who you say you are, and that, we trust that, right? Because a lot of times, again, people get traumatized by sort of the systems and the intake procedures that they get in other services. So, that was like the, we knew that was what we wanted to do. So another thing that we do is um, prefer gender pronouns in like every conversation. And I've realized I didn't even know that that sort of existed until I got to a place like the crib. And now I'm in circles where that happens all the time, thankfully. But you know, it's really hard when you're not sure and you're questioning, you know, what what's in my head, what's in my heart. And then now you have you get misgendered all the time. Like, just imagine what that must feel like. So that's why, I mean, we always encourage, right, you say your name and your preferred gender pronoun every time you introduce, right? So I'm Devin, I prefer he and him pronouns, right? Um, they're gender neutral pronouns, they and them. I'm not sure how familiar all you guys are with all of this stuff, so it, maybe some of you were like, this is so obvious, some of you were like, I never read any of this. I'm just trying to sort of help bridge the gap. Another thing at the crib is we have two gender neutral bathrooms. Again, that's sort of, you run into that. If, if you're presenting female and you're, in a female bathroom, but somebody thinks that you don't belong there, just that's just so crappy, right? And so we try to avoid all that by having gender neutral bathrooms where everybody can feel free to use either. Um, our sort of interaction is really relational, right? We want to, like I said many times, meet people where they're at and build on just sharing in each other's hopes and struggles and dreams. We have a portion of our night every night with gratitudes where we all the young people and the staff and the volunteers all come together to sort of say what they're thankful for. And it's a really beautiful moment every night. I mean, it's, you get a bunch of people in a room who really have often had a really rough day, you know? Talk about being homeless in the city. You, sometimes you can go a whole day without being recognized at all. People won't give you <coughs> eye contact. People ignore you. Like that. So we make sure that Everybody gets said hi to, and it seems so minor, but that's so important to sort of grow in healthy relationships and just being there for each other. Um, freedom of expression is encouraged, so we, our, our space is very, uh, it's pretty crazy. There's a lot of dancing, a lot of singing, uh, just sort of a wild and crazy environment where people are encouraged to dress how they want, experiment, question. And I think for these young people who have experienced so many different levels of trauma throughout their life, being able to just be as they are while they're figuring out who they are is super duper valuable. Again, I say things like we don't have the capacity to get people necessarily moved on to housing just from our resources, but there's this underlying value to being okay with who you are that is such a baseline to being a successful person in life, right? And a lot of people haven't had to struggle with that, but most of the young people that we see have and do and are. And so encouraging sort of that give and take is really important. Another thing is harm reduction. So that sort of goes against an abstinence only model kind of thing, because we, we trust that each young person we see is the expert in their own life. So we're not here to tell them, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, yada, yada, yada. We're there to sort of help people okay, if you're going to engage in sex work, how do you do it safer? Things like that, instead of, you shouldn't, you know, that's just not helpful, we've learned it all, right? So, 
um, it's all about reducing harm in what people are doing and not sort of telling people they shouldn't, should or shouldn't do things. Trauma-informed approach. So again, like I said, most of our young people, all of our young people have gone through trauma. And so the way that we want to take that is if a young person comes in and is kind of given a lot of attitude and being really disrespectful, our approach as a staff member is not to say, is not to punish and say, you're being disrespectful, we, we can't have that around here. It's to say, you know what, I can imagine what it's like to be stressed, right? To have a lot of issues, to not know if you're going to get into the crib or not and not have a place to stay. So it's thinking beyond just, this person is yelling at me to, maybe this person just has is trying to maintain control of something in their life, right? We have a lot of people, young people who wake up kind of angry, and that's because their day is being dictated by other people, right? They're told when to get up. They're told when they have to go outside. They're told that they can't go to the bathroom outside, things like that, right? Now imagine if you're 24 years old and that's still happening. So we, our trauma-informed approach is just to not take that stuff personally and have that negatively impact the relationship that we're building but just constantly be there to support and encourage um, as much as we can. Another big part of that is staff that gets it, right? So a lot of our staff, we have two of our full-time staff are people who had formerly stayed at the crib. And I think that that's super important as we try to build the program, that the voices from the community are constantly being represented at a staff level and at a community level. So we do community meetings where we have the voices and the young people in the space, and they try to help us build the community culture that we want to. So we have a lot of staff that have been formerly homeless, right? Um, because that we need that. I mean, you, you all see me, right? I'm, I'm up here a straight white male. <laughs> I don't necessarily look like a lot of the people we serve. So it's important that we have people of color, right, as our full-time staff. Even though we're in Lakeview, which that's not necessarily what the population in the community looks like. But when we're talking about mentoring and being there, there's a whole big difference of learning from somebody who has been in your situation before, right? So we recognize that and we kind of cultivate that within our, our staff. Because as much as we want to make sure that our young people feel accepted for who they are, they do the same for us, right? They allow us to be exactly authentically who we are. And so that's really important to us. And most importantly, right, is the non-judgmental kind of posture of presence. We can't fix anything, right? We're not here to change people, but we're just there to be there and be present with our young people as they sort of struggle, as they gain employment, as they get housing, right? We just want to be there for them, with them, as they're experiencing life, right? Be that sort of safety net of, of care and connection that they might not otherwise have. So again, we don't, most of the stuff that we do is based on posture and attitude culture, not necessarily outcomes. And so that's that's pretty much what I have. I look forward to hearing what you guys have to, any questions you have, but for now I'll pass it on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't have slides. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm sorry that Got an intro about Project Fierce already, but um, my name is Carrie, and um, can everybody hear me? I'm kind of quiet. Could you speak? I will try to talk as loud as I can. All right. Um, and one of the things I wanted to say that you mentioned, just because uh, I'm going to be there as well, and I think folks might be interested, um, but the documentary that you mentioned, The Home Stretch, is actually going to be showing um, in a couple of weeks on March 14th um, at the Cultural Center, like at 1 p.m. I think, and then after that, there's a resource fair with um, organizations. Um, that do work around uh, youth homelessness in Chicago, and so there'll be um, tables and resources. Um, so look that up, or, or ask me afterwards if you want to know more about that. Um, so okay, and I'm, I'm glad that one person sort of presented all the statistics, so that um, I don't need to repeat those. Although they can be repeated all the time, right? Like we need to really understand this problem. Um, but uh, so we're um, Project Pierce. Um, is thinking about this is um, so 
So services for um, LGBTQ uh, young people who are experiencing homelessness are primarily on the north side of Chicago, right? Um, and a lot of these organizations, like the crib, are doing fantastic work. Um, thank you. But, um, but sort of like Devin alluded to, um, the neighborhood is not uh, necessarily always the safest place for young people of color who are trans, who are queer, who are already experiencing trauma, which brought them to Lincoln for services in the first place. Um, you know, they're very vulnerable to um, residents, to cops. You know, it's not it's not safe. So we we want to. Um, first, think about providing our services in neighborhoods where um, folks are and where there's a great need, right? So on the south and west sides is where um, we're currently looking to buy our first home. Um, and the home and the programs that we hope to develop are, you know, identity affirming, like everything that the crib was talking about. Um, we want to meet people where they're at. Um, you know, our whole model is about um, responding to the needs of the young people that we are, are trying to serve. Um, and so we also want to create services and a model that is um, sustainable, something that we can replicate here in Chicago once we kind of get started and hopefully share with other cities or other groups that are interested in a similar um, model. And that model is, um, we uh, have been raising money like um, you heard for about two years and yeah the response has been amazing and um, all the money that we've raised has been sort of like from from the community you know we've reached out on Facebook we did Indiegogo's we've had all sorts of different fundraisers everyone has reached out to friends and family we've been building um, collecting membership of volunteers who come out at our events and who also reach out to um, to their networks and so it's really been a community grassroots effort and it's been um, it's been really wonderful and so part of what is so great about that is that you know it sees it shows um, it shows us and it shows the community that there's a need for this um, and that there's support for this and then you know the fact that we have raised money from the community and we've explained what our uh, what our plan is keeps us accountable right so um, so we're always sending updates about where we're at you know we um, you know, we thought we were ready to buy a house, and then we learned a lot about what it means to buy a house and fix it up, right? And so, you know, so it's been a process, and we um, and we're really, really close um, to buying that house. And we um, we are hoping to find a space that can house um, eight, like eight to ten young people. So again, you know, you say you have 53 beds, and that's nothing. Um, you know, there's you know, you saw the numbers, but um, eight beds is a start, right? And um, so we want to try to center um, those youth that have the greatest need, uh, who are in the most danger, right? So trans feminine folks of color, um, folks of color in general, queer and trans folks, you know, um, it's it's only February and since, since the beginning of this year, five trans women of color that we know of have already been murdered this year, right? So this, this danger is real um, and people need safe places to be and stay and live. Um, and so the way it will work is youth will apply and they live in the house for as long as it makes sense to them. If they start to get income, you know, they'll pay a little bit of that, right? It's, it's not, you know, we want it to be transitional. We want to help people get on their feet. It's not some place to stay forever. Um, so yeah, so, so folks will be living independently. You know, there's not really going to be staff in the house, but um, you know, people will get support as they need it from, um, the collective members, there's six of us on the leadership team and we all have different strengths and experiences. Um, some of us are social workers, some of us are youth workers, um, and we each head up different um, teams, right? So we have um, a housing team, a fundraising team, um, like a media, social marketing team, and then we all kind of, we meet once a month and we give updates on where we're at and sort of, you know, what like what, what are our next steps. And we're always raising money and we're always spreading the word and we're always getting inquiries um, and things like that. And so um, the thing about our model that is um, also really important is that it's a collective model. And um, it's entirely volunteer run at this point. And we don't, um, we're a, a nonprofit, but we uh, don't take grants or money from the government 
or from institutions that are going to place restrictions on the money they give us, um, and who, you know, because these institutions are going to be maybe out of touch with with the work we want to do, and we would really like to make decisions that are going to center the young people and that are going to be in line with what we set out to do. Um, so we have that freedom from grant guidelines, right? But it's also a lot harder to raise money and to sort of get ourselves out there because we're building it from the ground up. Um, so, um, you know, so we also invite community members if they want to be collective members to, you know, that means you're a volunteer and you also support financially at like whatever level that is for you. So, you know, you could be a collective member by giving five dollars a month and volunteering when you're able, right? Or you can give a lot more than that if you have that or whatever it is. Um, and sort of the way we kind of run our meetings, our events, and everything like that is falls in line with the way that we want to practice all of our work, right? We, um, we are always checking in with each other, we're addressing trauma within our own organization, in our own lives, and in the other work we do uh, that kind of informs, you know, this work. Um, and so, and we also have, people have been starting to reach out to us with other inquiries, right, about um, housing for folks that they know of, or like how can we support community in other ways, and the fact that we, you know, are all connected to the work or know other folks, you know, we've been able to kind of also function um, as a network for resources, like whenever possible, or at least to point people in the right directions. Um, the other important piece of our model is that we are going to have, we received a grant from the um, from CFW to have a youth leadership council, which is going to help us kind of make sure we're addressing the needs of young people, right? So we have one, one youth who's going to be sort of in charge of a youth leadership council of folks who are going to give us input on how programs should be, how do we outreach to folks, um, and just how to, how to make it make it what we want to see. Um, so involving young people at every step of the way is really important to our work. Um, that was kind of all I had about our structure and what we're doing. And then all of those teams that I mentioned before, I just kind of wanted to plug, you know, those are all opportunities for people who are interested to get involved and help us out. Because um, like I said, we rely on the community. So you know, if you are interested in helping out with housing, media, or fundraising, or know people that have resources in areas you know that's great um, things like you know things like we've we had someone say oh I'm a housing inspector I can do that for you you know it's little things you know um, we also take in kind donations and things that we might need for the house um, and there's a whole um, wish list on our website um, and I have some cards for that um, the other thing you can always do is spread the word talk about it discuss youth homelessness in your circles and in your work you know just talk about it um, and also come to our parties and fundraisers and network with people and um, support the work in general. Um, and then another thing that we do, um, just one last thing just to talk about, supporting community and community accountability is for our events and for our outreach. We really try to do that. So, um, yep, the um, amazing theater group that was mentioned earlier, you know, they came and performed at one of our fundraisers, um, you know, to kind of so that we could really center the folks we're thinking about. Um, and they, they do really great work, you know. And, and as, as often, whenever we can, we try to use um, people in the community and pay them for their work when they can help us out. Um, so I think I'll stop there and we can move to the next. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Carrie and Devin. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit of an overview of, um, is this one? I don't want to be in the light. <laughs> I want to see the light. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so my name's Tracy Bame. I've been working in uh, LGBT media since 1984 in Chicago, and um, a couple of years I kind of got, a couple of years ago I got kind of fed up of covering this issue again and again and again and seeing that our organizations, the problem was still there. We've had this problem in our community. <laughs> Uh, large levels of homelessness for decades. And um, so a couple of years ago, Windy City Times did a series called Generation Halstead where our reporters spent three months on the streets with the youth and did this, they did a really terrific job. Um, and nothing came of it, except we got some awards. And I was like, well, this is ridiculous. The youth came up with solutions and the adults 
didn't listen. And so uh, a year ago, Kim Hunt uh, from Affinity and I uh, pulled together a team of youth and adults and put together a summit on youth homelessness. Um, our emphasis was LGBTQ only because there's such a large percentage, but everybody was welcome. And so everything we've been doing since then is always open to all youth. Um, we're doing an entrepreneur's training this Saturday, for example, and probably about half are straight and half are LGBTQ. Um, but so I'll talk a little bit about, you know, obviously we're an LGBTQ newspaper, but this issue transcends um, those, those, uh, those kind of definitions. Um, so that summit was really, uh, it certainly was eye-opening for a lot of people who attended. The, it was a three-day summit. The first day was at Lurie Children's Hospital. It was only open to the youth um, and then the, the facilitators. The second day was open to everybody and it was at UIC. And then the third day was at the Museum of Broadcast Communications where we did a reporting out sessions and uh, it was really kind of fun. We had some of the facilitators interviewing people who participated. It was, it was really fun. That whole day is available on video online. Um, and then a couple months later, we released a 70-page report from that summit. Um, what you have here is kind of a three-page summary of what we've been doing since then, but at the top you can see a link to um, the website and also the reporting PDF. I also have business cards up here. I'm happy to send out any links you might need, get you any kind of materials you need. About half of that report is the raw notes from all of the workshops. Uh, we typed all of the workshop notes, raw notes, so that people could see them and, and if they're interested in one of the areas, they can see the dig down. Um, but there were some top level summaries that um, were, to me, well, first of all, let me just say this. This issue is so damn solvable, right? This is ridiculous. We don't have three million refugees from Syria, right? We have thousands of people in a city that has housing and land. We're not San Francisco where they ship them out to Oakland, right? We have land in Chicago. So this problem is solvable. So if we start from that idea, how we get to solutions, the only way we're gonna get to solutions is stop working in silos and individual organizations and being grant driven, right? So we need to think outside the box. It's so wonderful that Great Cities is getting engaged on this because I got a million ideas and, and so does Kim and so do all the people working on this. We just need brain power. Not a lot of this is about money either, because if you have the right solution, the money will come. If we want to build a tiny home community for the homeless, the money will come. <laughs> we just got to get the resources to start that, get the zoning, get the, the front end stuff done by the experts, the money will come. So I'll, I'm going to just summarize where, what we've been doing since last May, briefly, and then I'd love to get questions on it. And again, anybody interested in this issue, you can plug in. <laughs> with Project Fierce, with Night Ministry, with Teen Living, with Unity Parenting, there is the right organization out there for you. Um, so we can engage. Um, the, the first big thing that happened, and probably the thing that brought people most to tears, including myself at the summit, was the issue of storage. This issue has been talked about for years, and, and experts say, oh, it's just a Band-Aid. I'm sorry, the youth ask for storage. So it's not a Band-Aid to them, it's a quality of life issue. Laundry storage showers, laundry storage showers. Um, that came up time and again. If you have, in February, two backpacks, one with your books and one with your clothes, and you're staying overnight somewhere, you're probably going to lose one of those backpacks, either through theft or you have to leave it outside. Um, you cannot carry it around in the cold, etc. Storage is a very real quality of life issue. It's also a health care issue. They're losing medications. They're losing documents. So we have uh, a person named Laura Brooks who's working on a six-month grant to look at the solutions of storage in Chicago. San Francisco, uh, not San Francisco, LA and San Diego have homeless storage initiatives. Seattle has one. We want to do one in Chicago. So we're going to first try to bring lockers to existing agencies that have asked for them, um, if they have space. And then we also want to create some freestanding opportunities, which is a great opportunity for universities to get engaged. UIC has a great commuter, commuter center. Um, that youth to experience homeless use, it could be a great model for other uh, campuses. So the storage is going to have a report out probably around May, and we might even have some lockers being built by then in some of the agencies. So it's going to be a fun project we'll hope to engage the youth to come in and help paint them, and it'll be a great media day uh, to call attention to this very, very real issue. Um, we're also working with Google to try to create some online solutions for document storage so that the youth are not tied to any one agency storing their documents. Um, and, and they can access them themselves from anywhere. 
The second project we launched uh, was the 750 Club Apartment Adoption Project. We launched that in December. Um, and thanks to people like Laura Stempo and other people in this room, uh, we actually have funded, um, eight, we've raised $18,000 to fund the first apartment. It's two years, case managed through agencies. Um, so La Casa Norte is going to get the first apartment next week. Um, they're trying to find a youth uh, for us. Um, they will case manage that for two years. Um, so it's $18,000, $750 a month on average to get youth into apartments. They have to be in school and or working. So there are some qualifications to get in. Most of them will come out of the transitional housing that exists now. Um, so there's, we talk about overnight shelters, we talk about drop-in centers that are not overnight shelters. There's transitional housing that's usually two years. And then after that, there's sometimes scattered site housing available. This is what this is. So this is scattered site housing in different apartments around town. Um, this hopefully then frees up a space in the transitional housing, which then frees up a space in the shelters, etc. There are fewer than 300 beds of any kind in the city of Chicago for youth. So these are all drops in the bucket, but they're drops. <laughs> That's where you start. So this is a very small scale. Uh, we wanted to call attention to the issue and also allow for adults who want to get engaged in this and help a youth directly, but can't necessarily adopt themselves. So you adopt an apartment. Um, and exciting news, we're probably going to announce mid-March, we're going to do an overnight sleep out on Halsted Street, very intentionally, if we get the permits, to call attention to this issue. It'll be like an AIDS walk pledge drive fundraiser that any organization, such as Project Fierce and Night Ministry, can use to piggyback to raise money, just like with AIDS walk. AIDS organizations raise money and get the bulk of the money they raise directly. Um, and then some of it will go to the 750 Club and to our fiscal agent. So that'll be a way for some of these agencies to raise money together, lift all boats, and also counter the cuts that they're going to be getting from the state of Illinois this year. Um, drastic cuts. Um, the other thing, laundry, 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 laundry. A huge quality of life and healthcare issue, job issue, school issue, et cetera. So what we, uh, we Kim, Kim's partner Mary actually, took our raw data and last week created a geo-targeted map of all the agencies who asked for laundry machines or laundry vouchers. So what we now have, and we're going to start working on, is, is let's say there's a place at 47th and Halsted, it's a drop-in center with no laundry. We want to find a laundromat within a mile of there that we can either get free or discounted laundry and raise money. This is a solvable problem. Right now, they've only asked for 1,200 vouchers a month. Right? That is such a raisable money, either through fundraising or through donated um, laundry support. So we're, gonna, we're launching that. Um, there's other, other things that we think are a little more far-fetched. One is transit subsidies. They don't even do that now, but they do it for seniors and veterans to the tune of almost $30 million a year in the state of Illinois. So we did a transit survey across the whole state of Illinois and asked what the needs are. It's about $1.2 million in requests from homeless youth uh, serving agencies. And we're going to put the request out there. It's highly unlikely it's going to happen now. But as long as we have the data, we're going to keep putting it out there. And there might be some private solutions. Um, the venture system in particular has really screwed over these agencies. Uh, many of them can't afford now two passes. They can only afford one because of the cost of venture um, charging it. So transit is a big, big quality of life issues. And these agencies are just hurting desperately. They don't have the passes to send the youth to a doctor's appointment. Um, to classes, things like that, that they used to be able to. Um, job training, entrepreneurial training, all of that we know is a huge gap. Um, it's a luxury item for many of these agencies and it's only done if they get a grant. Um, Chicago House, for example, has a has job training, but it's one of the few that does. So we need more of that, more skills-based, um, a lot of it for the higher functioning youth that really, it's just a, a one little small step to getting that right training. Um, we could really work with some colleges, universities in, in Chicago to, to get them that, that level. There's an amazing organization called TransTech, um, Angelica Ross founded last year, that's doing technology training for transgender individuals and gender nonconforming. Fantastic group that I suggest UIC could partner with. Um, and uh, so that's one area. Um, to me, the three big buckets, the three big feeders into the largest number of home, homeless uh, youth in this population are uh, families <laughs> that aren't accepting, colleges and universities that are not housing their youth who are homeless. They have, an, I think, they have a moral obligation, um, and that would cut a huge number of the 18 to 24 year olds, and they would also then probably have a better chance of graduating. Um, and um, the foster care system of Illinois. Um, statistics show that obviously a large number in Los Angeles, I think, is the only number that's been done objectively. At least 20 percent of the youth in the foster care system in Los Angeles are LGBTQ. 
I think that's probably about the same in Illinois. Um, and if you are LGBTQ within the uh, foster care system, you have almost a double rate of experiencing homelessness at some point than your straight counterparts. So we need more significant um, work from the outside community working with TCFS to get more families who are supportive of a diversity of their youth and as well as give these youth more supports if, if they, as they age out. Um, right now the Rauner budget looks to be cutting the 18 to 20 year old, one year old supports that they've been providing so that's going to create another whole level of homelessness. Thank you. Um, so we need to provide more support for them as they age out of foster care and become in that vulnerable place. I mean, I moved back home after college. I know probably a lot of people that <laughs> moved back home after college. These youth don't have that um, opportunity to do that, so we need to provide more, more opportunities on that. Um, the final thing is I think we need to dream big. So I, that's all I feel like I do is dream big. Um, and and these, are, these are solutions that are solvable with the city engaged and with uh, universities engaged on these, on these problems. During the build up to the Youth Summit, I read probably about 20 studies on this topic, um, ranging from academic based, government based, et cetera. Almost all of them came to the same basic conclusions. So I think we have to stop studying and start doing, taking those things and making them actionable because they're almost all saying the same thing. So stop studying, stop that money, the millions of dollars that's going into studying this issue needs to be going into job training and all that other kind of stuff that app helps solve this issue. So I'm happy to talk about all this, um, but I want to leave plenty of time because I know it's the middle of the day during the week. So we can go to questions. I'm not sure if we're going to have a moderator or how we want to handle questions. That might be you. <laughs> okay. Take it away. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Official capacity. Okay. Do you want to Uh Yeah, that might be good. Yeah. All right. What's, what's burning? What's, what's coming up? Laura. Um, I'm the co-chair of the LBTQ Giving Council at the Chicago Foundation for Women. We're the ones who gave Project Fierce the funds for the Leadership Council. And one of the things that I have learned in the years that I've been on this council is what a tiny contribution can do. What giving $1,000 or $75 or a roll of quarters for laundry, what a huge difference that can make in someone's life. And so I really want to reiterate what Tracy is saying, that some of these, the problems that are the biggest, are in some ways the easiest to solve. You know, what's a washing machine? It's just not that big a deal compared to some of the gigantic things that people spend money on. And the, the thing that made me cry, not at the summit, but here at UIC, is the thought that there are young people who would rather pay for books and go to college than rent an apartment. The, and to think about youth who are that determined to move out of their situation, that they will sleep on the floor or couch surf with their friends or stay in a shelter because they so much want to go to college. The idea that they can't, you know, for some stupid reason, just that's that's what really gets me. And to sit in a big university and think, you know, really get some damn showers. I mean, the, the Computer Resource Center is a, is a really great resource, but not everybody even knows that that's there. And only in this last, this academic year started doing things like collecting food for students who don't have food. It's so easy to address some of the problems that the, that the people who are experiencing this say would change their lives. So what we did last fall from the summit is we took all the youth agencies in the Chicago region for the transit we did statewide, but for everything else we did Chicago region. We asked them everything from toothbrushes to diapers to food and everything. So that's what we're doing. So the laundry was the next one we did. But we're gonna we're having this on food. So if a shelter says they only get funded for lunch, can we get them breakfasts? So we will have all this data. It would be very helpful for any data geeks here or graphic geeks to help us take this data and make it more accessible because then we can take it to the Johnson & Johnsons of the world and say, look, across all 30 agencies, they spend cash on these items. So that each agency, some agencies like Night, Night Ministry has a wonderful development department, right? But a lot of these agencies do not. You know, Unity Parenting, we, we could get them things that they spend cash on so that then they can spend their money on staff. So, I, so anybody that's interested in the data digs will really help us get this out to the corporations and donors 
to get the donations. That, that was actually the other thing I was going to say is if you don't have money, you have labor, right? You know, you can you can make a community dinner for the participants, and yet yeah. they do it twice a week. All you have to do is contact them and say, I want to make dinner. And that's it. That doesn't cost a lot of money. It doesn't take a huge amount of time. It's just you make a meal, you show up, you eat with them, and you've addressed a problem mm -hmm. in, a, in a really practical way. Yeah. One of the things that was so exciting about the summit was letting all of these different organizations come together in the same space and talk to each other, right? Start to synthesize for in a really local way. What's going on in Chicago? What's missing? And so one question that I have, Tracy, maybe for you, is um, are, what's, what's being done to sort of collate all that information? I mean, how, how you're asking for da data geeks. Are you looking for people now to help sort of pull well, the, uh, like Well, from the summit, analysis? we do have a 70-page thing. Yeah. But I do, my dream is, I have my chips. But uh, my, I think by May, which is the year anniversary, we will yeah. have a more actionable plan. What I don't want to do is have another summit right. because I go to my, way too many conferences and nothing happens, right? So our goal is to create action tanks, action projects, whether that's on transgender violence or on whatever the topic might be, action tanks. And so in, a, in May, I think we're going to have more on that. But what I, um, what I know what was the best thing for the people that attended that were not youth was a chance to vent and network with one another, and we need to, we do need to institutionalize that. It was the mid-level staff that feel so disempowered sometimes within their own organizations that by being together, they felt empowered. Mm -hmm. And they and they networked with each other, and so there's informal networks that were created. So I think if UIC or somebody wanted to take that piece of it that brought mid-level, and some, some executive directors were there, but it was mostly mid-level. Mm -hmm. And they are the next leaders. And if they don't stay with the organizations, which we know is part of the real problem, is turnover of staff. This is a this something this is something that could address that high turnover of staff because they would feel there's hope there's other people out there like them that are going through the same thing. So um, providing that kind of space for exchanging ideas, yeah. creative problem solving, innovative yeah. thinking, yeah. all of that is really a need. Yeah, that was I expressed. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, and that's in the report too. The the they were so kind of. Grateful, I think. Uh, I don't know if, yeah, they they expressed anyway gratefulness that they could meet their peers. Again, the turnover is so high. A lot of people like somebody just started in an organization I know moved from Michigan, so they they don't know who their peers are here right. at, at all. And it was the opportunity to do that. So I think that could be a great um, project. Yeah, and there were so many young. Oh yeah, the young people were terrific, and I think a lot of them got connections to adults from other agencies that they might have been able to take to the next level too. I am hearing you say, it's within reach, we can do this. And Laura's saying, this is so fundable. What was what else was ha popping up for people as you were listening and hearing? I saw a couple of hands, yeah. Do you want to start us off? Sure. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name's Claudia Mosher, and I'm here with my DCFS team. I'm a consulting psychologist for DCFS. And there's several of us here from DCFS today because we are part of the problem, and we want to be part of the solution. And um, some of the things that we're doing that I'd like to hear some you know, people's ideas on so that we're not doing it in a silo. Uh, we're re we're, we have an LGBTQ policy that has been excellent, but has needed to be revised because we know a lot more about our trans kids. And so many of our transgender youth or gender non-conforming youth are coming up earlier and earlier and earlier. So we're revising the policies to make them more reflective of the need of our transgender youth. So that's in process. Um, we've done quite a bit of training, but it has to be an ongoing thing, training and reinforcement of training uh, with our social work staff, particularly at the shelter which is the place, the, the primary shelter, where if there's not a, a, a home immediately for a youth to go to or a child to go to, they're in the shelter. We've done, we're doing everything that we can to make it as LGBTQ friendly as possible. And we've had some success with that. There's some challenges with it, but we've got some good things in place, like one of the, one of the things that took a little bit of doing, but that we've got in place now, if a, if a youth identifies um, as transgender, um, Unfortunately, we can't have them sleep on the floor that they most identify with, but we can get them a single room on the floor close to the staff so they're not like way down the hall or something. Um, so that on the floor, the, oh, I call it the plumbing, I think it's the simplest way to say it. But they program on the floor of the preferred gym. 
and the wearing the clothing of the preferred gender. It's not perfect, but it's better than it was where, like, if you come to, you know, some places have just been absolutely horrible for the kids, you know. No, you can't wear that dress right now. Well, now what we're saying is, no, you can't wear that dress that's showing your hoo-ha, but you can wear the dress, you know, so the girls have to have this, to follow the same rules that, that all the girls have to follow for how they, how they do their clothing. Um, we want to start an LGBTQ Youth Advisory Board. And we want to, you know, similar to the one that we have for the LG, just the general Youth Advisory Board. But that's the next piece that we're working on. And I would like some ideas as to how to reach youth that would like to be a part of that LGBTQ Advisory Board so we can get moving on that. We're also, you know, you know a lot more about this than I do, working on palm cards and pamphlets and LGBTQ um, friendly posters to put up in different DCFS sites, because as a gender non-conforming lesbian, uh, I'll go into some of my agencies, I've got several POS agencies, and the first thing I see sitting there is a Bible, which with my background, I don't see as friendly. Um, and so, you know, trying to work with, you know, some of the, you know, some of the agencies, just on simple visual things, like, yes, have your Bibles, but not in the waiting room. You know, if you need to look up some stuff, you know, Google it. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, I've taken up a lot of time, so anything, anything I can hear from folks, I'd really appreciate it. Can I have a back? Um, yeah. So I'm Bridget Glickman. I'm the Director of uh, Community Outreach and Marketing for DCFS. Um, so you touched on this whole piece of foster homes and how a great deal of the homeless LGBTQ youth community are have had DCFS involvement in, in some way. So the other place that we really need your help and, and uh, one of the action teams you're creating maybe can you know, we'd be happy to participate is on recruitment and retention of foster homes that who will accept, nurture, and keep safe our LGBTQ youth. And we have a dearth of those homes. And until we can have more of those homes, we can't really see uh, how we're going to prevent this problem. So, you know, that's where we need the community's help, I would say, the most. Is there targeted outreach around that? Well, <laughs> we are a new, uh, we have a newly formed LGBTQ um, ad hoc committee at DC, yeah, for lack of a better word, change that name, um, at DCFS and, um, one of the main players on that team is our newly hired resource and recruitment manager. And so I do a lot of recruitment myself, and between her and myself and the committee, we are going to develop strategy, um, outreach strategies for, to target that community. And, and I think that it's important to note and to say that when we say that we are recruiting foster homes for LGBTQ youth, it does not mean that we are specifically trying to recruit LGBTQ homes because we know that we would never have enough. So we, that's really a huge challenge of ours is, you know, we understand that, well, not all LGBTQ licensed homes want LGBTQ kids. So, okay, so sure, you know what I'm now, now I feel under pressure. Yes, because and the, the leader of us right here. No, <laughs> yes. you know, Sorry. we go back and the person that's the coordinator <laughs> hasn't said a word. Uh, I'm, Jane, I'm Jane Kelly. Uh, I work for DCFS. I'm proud to work for DCFS. We've had pretty bad press lately. We're very proud to work for them. Don't believe everything you hear. And um, I uh, was blessed, actually, to accept position of the statewide LGBTQ coordinator, uh, which was very exciting for me because I've done, my, my, my background is in social work, that's what I've done in England, I originally worked for child protection in England, and then worked in the community, which I'm so glad I did in Chicago, so, because one has to know how to hustle for resources, so, you know, that's a strength, I think, for community safety workers. So I'm so happy that um, I did that before I joined DCFS. The downside is it, it means I can't retire as quick as the rest of them. Let me do their career. There you go. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to say um, around the um, efforts is that um, 
we've got kids that uh, will say, I only want to go to you know, uh, uh, the cave. That's, that's what I want. And we talk, and we talk about, well, have you thought about um, going to a family that would be supportive? And, affirm, and I think Carol was talking about that. And that's, um, uh, sorry. Bridget. Yeah, and that's what we call it. Excuse me. I'm so sorry. Thank you. And that's, and that's what we are looking for. Um, we did a training once at, um, with um, corrections. And one guy said, which was really funny, uh, well, don't gay families make gay kids. <laughs> and I wanted to say, well, no, they come out of eggs. <laughs> of course I didn't. But that's sometimes the mentality. Um, thankfully, we have workers that don't, at least not at that level. Uh, and the beauty is that our young people, because we, we, we're getting a lot of yeah, I, I'm, I can't believe it, but I'm one of the old ones now. And the senior ones, the ones I mentor. But we have some young people that have very different attitudes um, than maybe some of our older ones. Who are on board some, but I am just, just so delighted um, because they have friends, or they are. I mean, they're, 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 they're not there to disclose, but the difference in that is it is great and so open to wanting to learn on what can we have. Um, yes, we, we need foster homes. We need foster homes for all our children. Um, and the the resource and recruitment, they came together this new initiative about a year ago and that was to particularly zoom in on kids with special needs. Um, and that, when I say kids with special needs, it includes all sorts, the medically complex, um, our kids with severe behavioral and emotional problems, the, our, our small ones, we do not want to put them in residential, um, but they bounce around from foster home because the foster parents can't manage their behaviors, which are unbelievable, very, very difficult. Um, and of course, we want foster homes that are affirming and supportive. That's LGBTQ. Really, yeah, this is great. I mean, it's good to hear from the three of you and know we have a presence from DCFS in this space. And it sounds like there are some new things getting started and that maybe some people want to speak with you after or maybe some of the panelists want to connect with that because there are overlaps and Thank disconnects you. between this and what we're hearing. And But this is really useful for all of us to know but this I, is getting well, started. What I want to say is well, I picked up some really good ideas from oh, good. both of you. Thank you. Thank and especially you. around the youth advisory and putting them right there at the leadership level. Okay. Thank you. Well, I noticed there are a couple other people who wanted to chime in. So, Daniel, and then we'll go. Sure. Um, so, I believe this is a question for the woman from Patrick Fierce. Is it Carrie? Or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you had mentioned in your speech that there are some barriers in government funding towards fulfilling your mission, and so you decided not to go for that government funding. Can you speak to those barriers in government policy that they have sort of left you from considering that funding stream? Um, I guess I can't speak to like very specific ba uh, barriers, like what you know, what guidelines, what the specific guidelines would be that would interfere with our mission, but kind of just that idea in general that like there are always going to be some guidelines on. Um, the money, right? Like whether it's a lot, a lot of government funding. Is, so I work in nonprofit, so I'm a little familiar with it because that's how my my day job goes. Um, and so a lot of it is tied to numbers or outcomes and things that are measurable in in like quantitative ways, right? Or like you know you have to you have to serve a certain amount of people, or like they have to show you know that you moved from X to Y in six months, or they pull the funding, right? So it's um, and what if what we're trying to do doesn't fit into that little model, right? Um, that's just like a little example of, of like a bigger picture reason why um, monies can be limited. Does that sort of help? 
there, yeah. there's another thing which is well, the funding, funding has restrictions on what you're allowed to use the money to do. Right. So right. you can't buy alcohol, you can't always buy food. There are lots of limitations yeah. on how you can spend it. And if you're dealing with emergency situations mm -hmm. or want to be flexible mm -hmm. in what you do, what services you do, you really can't do that with government grants. So to focus exactly. my question a little bit more, okay. are there any guidelines within government grants that dictate gender identity or sexual identity in terms of um, the, administration, the administration of the grants? No, it's not that we wouldn't be able to serve the folks that we want to serve if we had government money. Um, so there's that at least. But, um, you know, um, like, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your first name. Laura. Laura said, um, you know, we, we really need that flexibility. Um, and then the other piece is, you know, a lot of, it's it's not as sustainable either, right? Because you have to reapply every year. Um, and there was one other. Oh, oh, we already are not able to serve um, anyone under 18 um, because of like special permits that we would need to do that. So we're already, you know, sacrificing some of what we would like to be able to do just so that we can stay outside of those. Um, those it kind of connects with um, Tracy what you were saying too about stop studying, start doing. You know, like the youth-centered yeah. approach doesn't always map onto yes. funding guidelines, right? Where you're just putting people first doesn't always show up in that kind of outcome. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, I teach at another university. Uh, CPS teachers and undergraduate, eighteen to twenty-five year olds actually all ages. I. Uh, Every time, every semester, I have at least three CPS teachers who have taken in a homeless person. I also have homeless undergraduates. I also have undergraduates who have a lot of experience working with teenagers. And uh, Tracy, dear heart, has been my clearinghouse for all of these issues. And I wonder if maybe we could have one place because I, you know, I know data geeks. I know graphics geeks. I have a lot of people I can pull in. I have space in my house. Maybe just even a Facebook page or something. Well, so for now, all of the data and everything is on the, the website, the second website that's on, on this page. That has, I listed all 20 studies <laughs> that are out there that are relatively new, um, as well as other, as we do new projects. Um, also out of the summit, we did a mobile-friendly uh, device for, um, website for youth that'll start being populated with information for the youth, like to geo-target services. And um, there's also a new homeless resource book that was put out by a law firm downtown, the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, has information on that. But I agree, so figuring out better ways to communicate and get information about people's events out, uh, benefits, things like that would be great. So, um, you know, people that are interested in the communication side of this, happy to talk to. There's the listserv that Laura. Laura Brooks puts out a terrific listserv if anybody's interested. It's basically those kinds of things. Um, people send her a press release, or like we posted, I sent her this day's thing, and, and Laura put it out on that. So a lot of people that are care about these issues, Laura Brooks. And again, I have my card here, and I can get you connected with Laura. Is she here? Laura's not here. So, I mean, I'm just saying, I, you know, on a given day, I have five people who are willing to do something. Where do I send them? Do I, do I keep emailing you? I, I, you can email me, but I, I don't you think that's the most efficient way to no, do I it. Um, I think it's more finding out what all these agencies do. Okay. And uh, depending on what they're interested in. You know, I mean, so if someone in, wants to be an intern at something, again, there's all these agencies. Laura actually is more of a better, a better, better clearinghouse than myself. Laura's the one doing the storage summit. Laura also just uh, worked with UFC to open a drop-in center in Washington Park every Tuesday night. There's a new, brand new drop-in center happening in, in Washington Park, and Laura spearheaded that. I can that. connect you to Laura if you want to yeah. see me afterwards. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anyone else who wants to chime in with this or had a, a sort of an aha moment or um, something you want to contribute? I know we have a lot of different sectors and disciplines represented in this space. It would be great to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tracy, you said that something about Ventra um, is screwing over some agencies and able to provide transit passes uh, for their um, right. youth. Um, I presume it has something to do with the $5 registration fee? No, it's also the 50 cents. Well, go ahead. It's the 50 cents to charge, you know, when you're charging it. And the time limits on the passes. And but Yeah, I mean, so like for at the crib, we used to, we used to offer eight incentivized chores 
So eight different young people could get in one day um, bus pass for doing a chore, and we could provide up to 12 people who got turned away a bus pass to at least get on a train and maybe ride that all night, right? But we've seen since Ventura has stepped up the price, we no longer can give turn away bus cards to anybody. We can't give them out to, for people to go see appointments, to go see their parole officers, things like that. And we've had to reduce the number of chores that we can do to six. And instead of a one day, they get two one rides. So like, that's the impact in just eight months. And just think about how that impacts all of those young people. So the cost of the pass didn't change because of Ventura, it changed because CTA raised fares. Right, yes. so, right. But so does the inherent operation of Ventra preclude you from buying passes? So I spent an hour buying single ride Ventra cards, including that 50 cent, just as far as I know, profit fee, um, because we can't get it. There's nothing that I know of that we can that can make it any different where we can get them cheaper or get them like at a discounted rate. So it's just things like that. Right? I had to buy 200 passes for the summit. I had to use four different credit cards. I had to go to different machines because they had caps on them and the 50 cents on every damn pass and those expired. Yeah. So we, so I mean, right. it, it's, it's a it's a bad system for social service agencies. Yeah, even like, you know, folks who, so, um, I, so the nonprofit I work at, even folks who used to come for groups or for appointments, you know, we could just, we would buy a pack of 20 cards and give someone a card, right? Now somebody needs to like have a venture card already. They have to find a staff member who can like go and swipe it in the machine that we have upstairs. You have to like go through finance and like, you know, then if you're lucky, you can like get money put on someone's card and then like, you know, I have five people's cards, I have to remember whose card they have and like, it's, you know, it's a barrier. Yeah. Any, any transportation people in the room want to take this on? Am I sensing a little? I'm getting a little. I want to do a live auction about it. Anybody want to take that? What else can we do? What else we got a transit We're in our final working. moments. We're in our final moments together. Yeah. But thanks for bringing that up, right? Because when you, it seems like such a simple thing, and then you drill down into the complexities, and you think of all the other things each of these people is trying to get done in a day, and now they can't hand out transit cards, you start to see how complicated it gets in the day to day. Yeah. Final burning question or comment? So Gary, yeah. yeah, it's sort of unrelated, but I, I, I sort of want to take this opportunity um, just to. Uh, the other thing I do is I have, um, a mentoring program for young folks with disabilities. So if anybody here is connected to those young people, I'll talk to you after about that too. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Final word from each other. I mean, yeah, I think that you know it's been sort of hit. It's not. It's a big issue, but everybody can do something to help. I mean, I think about it at the crib, right? We have three staff. We have two volunteer spots every night. So if we have a volunteer who helps just serve food and a volunteer who helps monitor our supply room, now we have three staff who can talk to the young people one-on-one, -on -one, right? As opposed to one staff serving the food, one staff serving or doing the supply room, and now one has to monitor 23 people. So just little things like that. Like it's not even all about money. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. time. All of that like really makes a difference. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. And Tracy, any final word? Yeah, I mean, there's a way to plug in and there's a way to solve this, whether it's, you know, at Congressman Quigley's office level with Yoni um, or at, at the volunteer level, right? So we have to be creative solutions. You know, for the $18,000 we're going to raise to house one youth for two years in an apartment, we can build a tiny home. So that's the long-term dream. We need more housing stock at lower price levels and various price levels to keep people in school, to keep people off the streets. There's no, we should have a housing first model in Chicago because everything else flows from there. Health care, med mental health issues, everything else flows after that. Terrific, thank you. If you're just joining in this conversation today, stay in it. Consider this yes. the beginning. We want to hear from you. We want to connect with you and plug you in. Here's three individuals, and there's lots more that you can work with. Yes? Hi, I'm, I'm Yoni Kaiser. I'm uh, the LGBT liaison for Congressman Quigley, and I, I just want to say that Congressman takes these issues very, very seriously, and he's hosting uh, next Wednesday, actually, in Washington, the first ever uh, briefing with the Equality Caucus discussing issues of LGBT poverty and youth homelessness. And so this is going to be an ongoing focus of his and the Equality Caucuses, and um, I really appreciate everyone being here and <coughs> hearing this great conversation because uh, people in D.C. are listening, and they're taking it seriously, and want to find ways, despite the dysfunction in Washington, 
find ways of helping things. So thanks, thanks for doing this. Yeah. Thanks to all of you for coming out today. Um, feel free to stick around and talk. If you need more contact information, come on up here and get it. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thanks for